Hi, welcome you all to the 8th episode of Curiosity. So what did I learn in the week number 28th of 2020? That's what I'm going to share with you. Uh, please keep watching. So to this episode, we are going to cover across the discipline as usual. We are going to cover perception of danger, gender bias in workplace, male dominance in equestrian tradition, gender bias in STEM, mysterious Antarctic fossil, eyesight therapy with red light, masking and political polarization. So let us start with the first story of the week. So the first study of the week is published in the journal Science Advances and it's by a US team and the study's title is Elusive Consensus Polarization in Allied Communication on COVID-19 Pandemic. So the study analyzed the Twitter feed of famous politicians and uh, you know without uh, naming it's a double blind study and without even telling who is that uh, did algorithm like uh, artificial intelligence based you no know, regression based algorithms could they able to guess the political lineage and they could do that. You know, that's really, really interesting. So the background is that in democratic countries, including India, you know, the public is highly responsive to the cues sent by the political elite, the big political uh, party leaders, whose messages can encourage unity or deepen social cleavages. So they have a lot of power to shape the public opinion. You know, for example, wearing masks. If politicians are not wearing masks, then who is going to do that? People are blindly following the politicians. So, uh, the Twitter post revealed rapid politicization of the COVID-19 issue in the U.S. Congress. So, if you look at the Twitter feed of the U.S. Uh, uh, pe Congress people, you can see that for and against different policies. So, just by looking at the feed, you will know that who is, uh, you know, the political lineage of the person. So, the, uh, the algorithms are getting uh, more and more powerful day by day. And it's not just in the U.S. case, here in India as well. So, if you... Uh, you know, if the algorithms do that, I guess that they can actually see that the political lineage of the politicians. So using artificial intelligence, researchers could correctly classify the political party of the member who sent each COVID-19 tweet 76 percentage of the time based only on the text of the tweet and the date it was sent. See, the algorithms are getting really powerful. So the quote from the study. We find that Democrats discuss the crisis more frequently, emphasizing threats to the public health and American workers, while Republicans place greater emphasis on China and businesses. So if you look at the, these kind of terms like China and business, the chances are high that these are Republicans and those who are actually posing more concern on the workers, uh, you know, the grassroots level workers, as well as on the, the science, then uh, chances are high that they are actually Democrats. So our second story of the week is also uh, related. The, the title of this article published in British Journal of Political Science, um, a very famous journal, is that party cues in the news. Democratic elites, Republican backlash and the dynamics of the climate skepticism. So it's done by a Canadian US team with uh, N is equal to 3000. So what they actually looked at it is something called climate skepticism. You know those people who say that the climate change is not man-made. Uh, usually this is uh, classified as uh, pseudoscience, you know, they're anti-science. So as as a democratic elite, the, the famous democratic people, when they, their, uh, you know, the, the, the stance or viewpoint became stronger and stronger, uh, the Republicans tend to, uh, you know, uh, tend to alleviate themselves from the science. So polarization is aggravated by a strong political stance. So the background is that majority of Democrats believe that the human caused climate change is happening and they support the science while Republicans doubted uh, so-called climate change denialism. You know, so Republicans have become more skeptical of the science on climate change since 1990s. And why the Republicans are actually getting more and more skeptical of the science? Because elite uh, Democrats are taking more and more hard stance. So the polarization is actually fueled by uh, such hard stance. Uh, but is it actually good or bad? Of course, it's good, right? So hard stance in the sense, uh, the science, of course, science is about the truth. So if you're afraid to say the truth, then, uh, you know, uh, for the just for the sake of uh, political, uh, uh, you know, winning victories. So then that is, you're not actually being honest to yourself, isn't it? So evidence suggests that when the democratic politicians became more vociferously supportive of the science of the climate change, 
there was a backlash among Republicans, increasing the climate change skepticism. So if you want to decrease the climate change skepticism, the one option would be uh, don't support the science. But of course, that is not a, an answer, right? You have to support the science and scientific uh, thinking. Then only the society can make progresses. So, well, uh, you know, it's, it's debated, but this is what the, the studies says. And we have already discussed a related thing. I will come to it later. So this is a quote from the study. Together, these results highlight the importance of outgroup cue taking and suggest that the climate change skepticism should be examined through the lens of elite led opinion formation. So, the study says the elite politicians, uh, you know, the comments and tweets have got huge ramifications, just like the earlier study that uh, we just discussed, right? This study we have already covered in one of our earlier, uh, you know, the curiosity episodes that uh, one of the new psychology research finds extreme protest actions reduce the popular support for the social movements. So if you do this, uh, you know, your political party, if they do this extreme uh, protests, then that's going to be a backlash. It's just like the vociferous stance supporting the science so you know but uh, the, of course the uh, uh, stand supporting the science should never be a backlash even if it's a backlash then you know the truth stands truth isn't it so this is also a quite a, a related study so that we have already covered in a earlier episode of the curiosity the third story of the week is a very interesting study uh, it is by the uk's office of the national statistics so the study uh, is uh, they conducted 3000 people uh, from the census uh, record so the title of the study is the coronavirus at covid 19 related death by religious group england and wales from 2nd march to 15th may 2020 so they looked at the religious stratification of the covid 19 death so those in england and wales who reported having no religion in 2011 census had the lowest rate of death involving the covid 19 with 80.7 death per 1 lakh males and 47.9 death per 1 lakh females so those people who have no religion atheist or irreligious people uh, have got lowest uh, covid 19 related death so it's an eye opener so what could be the reason is it religious congregation that is actually the problem with the religious people they are congregate in a uh, you know in the, in the church or in temple or in mosque that could be a reason or lower public trust in science among the religiously conservative people the, the trust in science is very low among uh, multiple studies have shown that you know the the trust is low among the religiously conservative people and that is one reason that they are not following the government regulations on wearing mask or uh, maintaining the physical distancing you know so that could be one reason for that so higher age standardized mortality rate of the death involving covid 19 were in the muslim religious group with 198.9 death per 1 lakh males and 98.2 death per 1 lakh females people who identified as jewish hindu sikh also showed higher mortality rates than other groups so this is a quote from that study so if you look at the, uh, the graph carefully, you can see that uh, the highest one is Muslim, then Hindu, Sikh, Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, then religion is not stated, then other religion and no religion. So you can see that no religion have, uh, you know, this is actually adjusted, it's a normalized figure. Of course, people without any religion uh, are very, very low. Right, in majority of the countries, uh, they people tend to follow one religion or other. So this is a normalized figure. Uh, even in this case, the no religion have got, uh, you know, lowest impact of the COVID-19. Another very interesting, uh, you know, the revelation of this graph and this study is that uh, men are a lot more prone uh, to die of COVID-19 than the women. As you can see in every single graph, you know, religious or non-religious women are less likely to die from COVID-19. There could be lots of confounding factors. Uh, for example, men travel more than women, I'm not sure. So, but still this is a revelation. I, I uh, you know, I observe that revelation by looking at that study. Fourth story of the week is a paper published in JAMA, that is Journal of American Medical Association by a US team. And uh, it included, uh, you know, 9,850 cohorts. 
So the title of the paper is Association between Universal Masking in the Healthcare System and SARS-CoV-2 Positivity Among Healthcare Workers. So they looked at the healthcare workers. Remember, this is not for the public, but for the healthcare workers, though they are the study subjects of this study. You know, and they looked at the how how much COVID-19 incidence uh, rate is reduced by wearing mask. This study makes it very clear. After universal masking was implemented at Mass General Brigham, the rate of COVID-19 infection among the healthcare workers dropped significantly. So this is the medical uh, chain of the hospitals. You know, Mass General Brigham in the Massachusetts in the U.S. A quote from the study, for those who have been waiting for data before adopting the practice, the paper makes it clear, masks work. So, you know, the masks do work, friends. And before the masking policy was implemented, the SARS-CoV-2 positivity rate increased exponentially from 0% to 21%, with cases doubling every 3.6 days. You know, it was an exponential increase. After the policy was implemented, that is the universal masking. Universal masking means everybody has to wear a mask, you know. So the positivity rate decreased linearly from 15% to 11%. Uh, though the decrease was, uh, you know, significant, it wasn't that exponential decrease. Still, it's uh, amazing, you know, it is actually decreasing. Earlier, it was actually increasing exponentially, but it has started decreasing after this uh, universal masking. So masking or uh, implementing everybody to wear mask is extremely important policy. Unfortunately, pseudoscience and fake news are propagating everywhere. For example, this is one of the messages recently I got it. And as you can see that strongest protection is by N95 while it says that cloth mask that is DIY option virus protection is zero percentage. So as if a fabric mask doesn't protect you from the virus. No, it is it, this this is a, a complete nonsense. It is there is no science behind it uh, because the countries which are actually winning the race against the coronavirus for example New Zealand, uh, you know, they do have universal masking policy and the masking as well as the social distance the physical distancing uh, helps and as you can see that the things are not at all good here in india uh, unfortunately i hope the things get better soon uh, here it is actually growing in an ex exponential manner the i i would say the main problem is that the people are not following the government regulations the government has already made it clear that the mask is mandatory in public places and maintenance of the physical distancing but uh, people are not following those uh, union government uh, regulations uh, while if you can compare that with the somalia somalia is one of the poorest country in the whole world in sub-saharan africa and somalia it has already flattened the curve you know though they don't have any money uh, the reason is that they religiously followed uh, you know the masking guidelines and the mask has been integrated into Somalian society. Though they are poor, they always wear masks. So masks do save lives, friends. And here the, in India, we I just saw this story two days back that there are a lot of, uh, you know, fake N95 masks in everywhere in the uh, markets, online markets. So this is basically an investigative report from the Wire Science. So as you can see, these are not exactly the N95 and more than that, there is no point in going for this expensive N95 or fake N95 mask. You know, a simple fabric mask with the microfiber cloth is as good as N95 mask. I have been a big advocate of microfiber cloth in the mask. So you can watch some of my earlier videos, how to do this DIY. You can wash and reuse it multiple times, you know. So that is much, much better solution than going with this duplicate uh, things of this N95 mask. So if you look at the earlier, uh, the propagandist message, this message or so, uh, it is an advertisement for N95 mask. As you can see, the virus protection is maximum in N95, while all the rest, the protection is very, very low. So unless you wear the N95, you cannot. So it is basically, it's a fake news, you know. Please don't fall for such fake news. And more than that, uh, N95 mask or surgical mask is not good for the environment because these are disposable, use and throw. So it's much better to go with a fabric mask that you can wash and reuse it multiple times. You know, and it works. So our fifth story of the week is a paper published in the journals of gerontology series A, uh, you know, by a UK team from University College of London, UCL. And I would like to say that this team is uh, majority of them are basically from India. You know, they are, they are actually expats. They are based in London. 
so the study is very interesting it's about how uh, a color simple exposure to a simple color can improve your eyesight you know the uh, title of the study is optically improved mitochondrial function redeems age human visual decline so visual decline due to aging of course gerontology the subject itself is all about aging study of aging is called gerontology when you age the main physiological consequence is the decreased mitochondrial function or mitochondrial dysfunction is going to happen when you age it right so that you can reverse it or redeem it by uh, you know by this uh, optically improve optical improvement uh, by exposure to the uh, f you know far red light so declining eyesight can be improved by looking at the red light that is what this pilot study says so by the way the n is only 24 so that's a limitation they, it's a it's a very small scale study they have to uh, really increase the cohort size then only that study became a lot more significant but still it's very good it's an eye opener virtually so a few minutes of looking into deep red light that is 670 nanometer could have a dramatic effect on preventing eyesight decline as we age so three minutes each day for two weeks that is what they prescribe and there was 20 percentage improvement in the ability to see the colors or con color contrast sensitivity for those with age 40 and above 40 years and above by the way con is a kind of a cell in our retina of the human uh, eye you know uh, along with the rods rod cell and con cell and con do get uh, degraded uh, you know as you age because of the mitochondrial dysfunction so a caught from the study the retina ages faster than any other organ in your body it's very very interesting you know i never knew that the retina gets aged much much faster than any other. that is the reason that most of the old people have got eyesight problem so science works because the light stimulate the health of mitochondria which are like the batteries in our cells you know so that is really interesting and of course there are several studies that actually shows that exposure to light could save the you know the eyesight so 2015 study published in biological letters showed that near infrared light could spur energy production improve mobility and extend the lifespan of the fruit flies see very interesting study and 2017 study in neurobiology of aging of uh, visible red light at the edge of infrared reported 25 percentage improvement in the functioning of retinas in the mice so red light is the cue for improving your eyesight it's very very interesting i never knew that i learned it in last week so i'm sharing with you people so by the way uh, you know uh, fancy bedrooms like this uh, recently one of my friend he built a very nice house and the house bedroom has ceiling full of uh, blue color light uh, it's not good because the blue light interferes with your sleep pattern friends uh, not many people are aware of it uh, this is a very famous paper by munch et al in 2006 wavelength dependent effect of evening light exposure on sleep architecture and sleep eeg power density in men uh, published in american journal of physiology regulatory integrative comparative physiology you know so this is a, a landmark publication that actually and there are a lot of papers as well so exposure to blue light uh, will cause insomnia you know you are going to interfere with your sleep rhythm and even there are of course there are a lot of apps available that dims uh, the blue light you know that filters the blue light of your uh, you know your uh, smartphone or if you're using your uh, computer it, it can filter out you know so gamma control you can do it and even there are uh, you know the specs are coming to filter out the blue light though not much evidence is there it's much better to uh, stop exposure to this uh, you know the devices uh, just before the, you sleep and also get rid of this blue light from your bedroom uh, you know that is not going to help you to get a good sleep and uh, this is another very interesting paper uh, you know uh, last week i come across uh, it's connected uh, paper so morning blue light can advance the melatonin rhythm in mild delayed sleep phase syndrome so i have written one article about the sleep cycles so we actually sleep in cycles you know it's not like continuous sleep that we are going to do that so if you wake up in the middle of a sleep cycle then you're going to have impact on your whole day you won't feel much energy so it's always better to wake up at the end of the sleep cycle well you cannot time it you know 
Of course, there are apps that claims to time your sleep such a way that, you know, you are going to wake up at the end of the sleep cycle. But in case you wake up in middle of the sleep cycle, you know, uh, it's immaterial early wake up or late wake up. Sometimes you wake up very late and still you lack all the energy because you're waking up in the, you know, middle of the sleep cycle. Each cycle lasts only 90 minutes, you know. So if you do that way, wake up in the middle of the sleep cycle, uh, you know, of course, the energy levels are really bad. And during those circumstances, exposure to the blue light, uh, you know, that actually can, uh, you know, advance the melatonin rhythm. So the melatonin rhythm is all about the, uh, the energy levels, you know, uh, due to the wake up. So it's all about the circadian rhythm, isn't it? So in that circumstances, exposure to the blue light is good. So if you want to sleep or if you want to save your eye, a red light is better. And if you really want to, uh, you know, wake up, then blue light is better. So very interesting. So our sixth story of the week is, uh, you know, it's a paper published in PINAS by UK and Australia team. It's all about how we perceive the threat. Very interesting study. So the title of the study is Proximal Threats Promote Enhanced Acquisition and Persistence of Reactive fear learning circuits so the paper is quite interesting for me why let me tell you why so our brain handles a perceived threat differently depending on how close it is to us so if the threat is happening very close then the brain machinery for uh, you know to run or the emotional outpour is going to happen at that time not we are not going to think much about it so you know for example a fire or uh, if you you know if you are sexually assaulted uh, you know on the verge of sexual assault so you will try to run away or even you you might uh, you know use the physical powers to beat the person or kill the person so all these things ha can happen so uh, you know the, the that momentary actions result in many of the incarcerations in the jail uh, you might know that if you follow the, the news so that is what if the threat is very nearby then our emotional centers of the brain you know uh, of our human brain gets activated so if it's far away you engage more in problem solving or reasoning areas of the brain but up close your animal instincts that is emotion jump in the action and there isn't much reasoning so many of these decisions that we make when the threat is very nearby are actually you know it's it's basically because of our evolutionary legacy uh, re, according to the logic and reason these are foolish decisions that we might make and we might actually end up regretting those decisions for example uh, you know somebody is simply threatening you and you kill that person because of the emotional outpour and uh, that might land you in the jail for 10 or 20 years you know so it's not that you are actually consciously making that decision it's just that your uh, you know the uh, uh, evolution legacy of the brain you know those amygdala and those old centers are overpearing you so a quote from the study is that our findings highlight that threats invading peri personal space persist longer in memory and uniquely recruit a reactive neural fear system which has important clinical implications for understanding how near body traumatic experiences exacerbate the development of traumatic stress disorders so if this happens very nearby then you know it's going to have a, a lifelong ramifications so that is why uh, you know uh, abuse victims or sexual abuse victim especially going to have a tremendous impact uh, throughout their life of course there are ways to combat it and ways to actually treat it but still this is going to be a big thing so that study is actually a, a revealing it's it's actually a virtually a revelation seventh story of the week is a paper in nature by the u.s team the title of the paper is understanding persistent gender gaps in stem so what is a stem all about as you know stem is uh, you know science technology engineering and mathematics so male to female ratio among the u.s college majors in biology chemistry maths and many other stem fields are now about one to one so gender gap has been uh, reduced a lot so male and female are equally likely to go with many of the stem field but if you look in the stem field there are actually certain subject which have high gender gap uh, for example physics engineering computer science that's so, so called PECS it's actually part of the stem uh, you know and if you look at that ratio appears to have 
plastiode at about 4 to 1, males are 4 times more likely to opt for uh, you know the PEX discipline than the female and the study analyzed what could be the reason for it. So the new study shows that the gender disparity in PEX is not caused by the higher math or science achievement among the men. Many people have this belief that uh, you know this uh, uh, maths intensive subjects like physics, engineering and computer sciences uh, the men are inherently superior you know they are actually the brain is a lot more powerful to handle such problems than the women but the study says that is not the case that was not the case at all so the research found that the men with very low high school gpas in math and science were choosing these math intensive majors just often as the women with much higher math and science achievement you know so it is basically something to do with the culture or the mindset or the stereotyping isn't it low performing women increasingly opt out of the pecs you know, if the women perform lower uh, in, the, in the, the school, then they don't opt for the pecs. Well, the reason is not clear, but maybe uh, they might feel that they're not really, you know, suitable for the pecs discipline. They better go with some other disciplines. Well, maybe, uh, you know, this is due to the cultural mindset that the pecs are masculine disciplines, you know. So the quote from the study, it is possible that the masculine culture of these fields and the gender stereotypes attached to the pecs. So that could be the reason why, uh, you know, this disparity. So uh, lower performing, uh, lower grade men are opting for pecs in higher studies, while women who are, uh, you know, not uh, scoring well in pecs do not opt for the pecs in higher studies. So it's a very interesting study. Eighth story of the week is a paper published in AAAS Science Advances. By a UK Dutch and the US team the title of story is very interesting the paper I love the papers with this kind of uh, very interesting title in some professions women have become well represented yet gender bias persists perpetuated by those who think it is not happening so the second part of the story is the most important perpetuated by those who think it is not happening so people who think that gender you know gender bias is not happening are more prone for doing this uh, you know gender bias so workplace gender bias is being kept alive by people who think it's no longer an issue that is what the, the research says very interesting so two-thirds of the managers who thought gender bias was no longer existed were men you know but female managers with this opinion undervalued female staff just as much as male managers did one fourth were female and they even undervalued their female staff uh, a caught from the study managers who thought gender bias is no longer an issue recommended annual pay that was pound sterling 2564 higher for the men than for the women so uh, you know they are uh, they are uh, openly committing the gender bias in their decision making while reading this story an open ended question that arises in my mind is that the female leaders uh, do they have an overt anti women bias and tend to be tougher on women colleagues than men leaders so that is also a very interesting avenue for future research you know and non-leader senior woman colleagues too so you don't really have to be a, a leader a senior woman how do they actually treat the junior women so they might be having this kind of mindset i got ahead so i don't see why you cannot go ahead so that mentality the bossy mentality you know that is also overtly favoring uh, the anti-woman bias by women themselves you know that is really really bad by the way, this mentality is very common even among the, uh, you know, newly recruited uh, employees, including young scientists. You know, the, there are seniors, I knew that some of my colleagues are saying the same thing. Their seniors are saying that, well, I got a lap space uh, after working for 15 years. So, you know, it's indirectly says that you also have to work for 15 years uh, before getting a lap space, you know. So that mentality sucks really. So our next story of the week has something to do with horses, you know, so you might know about the horse, uh, usually people, the horse riders prefer male stallion rather than mare, the female horses and why that gender bias in the selection. So the ninth, this is a combination of two stories, you know, our ninth story of the week. So the first story is uh, published in a journal called Animals, a well-known uh, publication uh, by Australia, New Zealand team. So the, the, the title of the study is reported behavioral differences between geldings and mares 
challenge sex driven stereotypes in ridden equine behavior so the riders have tend to have a lot of misconception about the equine behavior that is basically the horse behavior that uh, the geldings are better than the mare the way gelding is stallion the male horse than the mare the female horse is that a real case or not that is what the study analyzed they looked at 1233 horses and the, the key question is are stallions better than the mares and a related story is a, a story published in the journal of archaeological science reports by French, Belgian and Danish team. What they looked at is 249 horses, you know, their skeletons spanning last 40,000 years. So it's an archaeological study. So what they found is very interesting. They found balanced sex ratio up until 3,900 years before present. BP means before present. So before present 3,900 years, it was balanced. You know, the, the horses that underwent ritualistic ceremonial burial, you know, the, the, they are actually the riding horses. So up until 3900 years, it was balanced. But from 3900 before present uh, onwards till date, the sex ratio is highly skewed towards male. The riders prefer male horses. So equestrians might say that they prefer predictable male horses over the females, despite no difference in their behavior while ridden. That is what the first study say. So the study found that, uh, you know, this is, a, this is just an artifact, just a human mental construct. There is actually no difference, uh, you know, the, the riding quality or predictability of female and male horses. So it is just that, the, you know, the, we, we tend to, the riders tend to think by themselves. A new study based on the ancient DNA, that is about the second study, uh, from hundreds of horse skeletons suggests that this bias started 3,900 uh, years ago when a new vision of gender emerged. You know, that sex bias emerged. So that's very interesting. So the quote from that study, second paper is, anthropomorphic gender notions may have shaped an ancient preference for male horses. So anthropomorphic, so we are uh, comparing horse with a human being and you know the male superiority you we are transferring that to the horses the, that's why the stallions are more preferable over mares you know but you know when i read this one there are actually different uh, dimensions there, there could be other confounding factors too uh, you know could breeders may have chosen to sell only male as means of preventing competition in their industry So it's all about the genes good genes. So while selling the male they can just castrate it It's very easy to sterilize a male than the female female sterilization is not that easy surgical, right? So that is that could be one reason that you know the males uh, are dominated in the the right ears but still it's not clear why not uh, 3,900 years and uh, you know before that so basically the horse herding started 5,800 years back so another potential confounding factor is that females are more worthy for the breeders obviously because 10 female and one male can be enough to start the business horse breeding business uh, you know uh, because one male can uh, mate with all 10 females so that is why uh, you know females are a lot more important for a breeder uh, that is why the breeder tend to sell the male horses while they keep the female because they just want to sell more and more horses right so that could be the reason our 10th story of the week is very interesting crazy fossil that the chilean antarctic explorers have found it almost a decade ago so they had absolutely no idea what this specimen is all about is it a rock or is it a fossil or is it an, uh, you know extraterrestrial rock so no idea so they simply named it as the thing you know the thing no idea about what the thing is all about so a new study published in nature by u.s chilean team looked at this fossil very carefully and they found that it is basically an egg it's a giant soft shelled egg from the late cretaceous antarctica very very interesting study so after nearly a decade of mystery scientists have confirmed that an unusual fossil from antarctica is actually a massive egg so 66 million year old egg likely came from a giant ancient reptile like mosasaurus an aquatic reptilian predator that lived in the late cretaceous you know millions of years ago the authors suspect lepidosaurian viviparity in which a vestigial egg is laid and hatches immediately 
individual who laid this egg is at least seven meter long a giant marine reptile by the way a lepidosaurian is basically you know the scale uh, you know two kinds of scale on the skin so it's it's kind of a reptile you know uh, i mean it's it's a lineage of the reptile viviparity means that you know it is actually living uh, birth live birth so you know instead of egg laying and taking long incubation time for hatching the egg so it is basically it's like human being right we in in our case the females uh, you know gave birth to a live baby isn't it that is called the viviparity so in this case it's a transition towards viviparity the egg it is an egg laying but egg has a very very tiny shell you know and the moments maybe seconds after the egg is laid the baby is out the dinosaur is out you know it's not exactly a dinosaur but it's very near to the dinosaur it's a it's a giant by any way it's seven meter long so it's a marine reptile so authors describe this new species as it's a new species in zoological taxonomy new species means you're describing a species based only upon the egg you know so the uh, the eggshell so this new species the name is antarcticolithus bradii so antarctico means antarctic it's isolated from antarctica right oolithus oolithus in the sense that it's egg uh, turned into a, a lithus means uh, rock you know bradii this uh, this term means bradii it's a latin uh, epithet means that it has taken a long time it's very very slow you know because 10 years is a long period for them to actually come up with this finding so originally collected from seymour island in antarctica but curated at the Museo Nacional de Historica Natural, so it's basically Chilean uh, Natural History Museum in Santiago for the last 10 years. Very interesting piece of study. So this is how it looks like. It's an artist's reconstruction of the Mesosaurus, you know, and the study says that it has got a minimum seven meter long. So it's, it's a massive reptile. Uh, you know that has actually roamed underneath our oceans, you know in late Cretaceous so coming to the news stories of the last week covid 19 treatment and vaccine updates so every episode of the curiosity i, I updated so as of uh, this week there is no change from the last week so we now have uh, you know for the phase three clinical trial we have got three candidates jilid uh, the remdesivir then roivan sciences gemsirumab and regeneron pharmaceuticals two antibody cocktail and we also have one candidate at the phase two trial that is atharsis now coming to the vaccine we have got two candidates or at the phase two clinical trial moderna therapeutics and sinovac and we have five candidates at phase one trials you know so hopefully one of these phase two clinical trial will come out sooner so of course a lot of media reports speculate that it's very very soon but i don't see that it's going to be that very soon it might take few months you know more for uh, any of this to come out in the market coming to observances for the next week july 20 is un world chess day if you like to play chess like of course i'm a big fan of chess you know so chess is also very interesting because uh, recently there is a lot of uh, hue and cry about black lives matter so the game chess is also overtly uh, many people say that it is also a racist why because it's black and white game and white has a supremacy right white supremacy because white start the game so very interesting and and also in the chess it's all men men fight in that uh, thing there is no women except the the queen you know so it is a gender bias and also the racism so i mean it's very interesting i mean a lot of interesting essays i read last week about this uh, you know the racism and uh, gender stereotyping in the chess something to ponder about so july 20th is moon landing day the apollo 11 has landed uh, in our uh, you know the moon in 1969 by buzz aldrin and neil armstrong right so it's an observation for that day so july 22 is mango day you know i love mango the king of fruits and more than that mango has a lot of health benefit friends uh, it has got a lot of antioxidants and copper you know and of course a lot of uh, interesting thing but still of course it also contains a lot of sugar and uh, you know uh, you should not eat much uh, because sugar is not really good even though it is fructose it's not good uh, you know if you want to control your blood sugar but still mango is really good it's delicious uh, yeah 
So coming to astronomy related observances for the next week, July 20, Saturn shines at its brightest. So the best day of the year to spot the Saturn. Have you ever seen Saturn, uh, the ring of Saturn through a telescope? It's fantastic. You know, even a small telescope that you buy through Amazon, you can see it, you can spot it. So just check it out. It's Ju Ju July 28th, that is day after tomorrow is the best day for that. So July 23 onwards, you are going to see Perseidus meteor shower. So this is a very good, I mean, you know, in the night time, you can go in the sky and see these meteors. So fantastic for the sky grazers. July 22-23 uh, Comet C 2020 F3 that is also known as Neowise will be the closest to the earth. It's a binocular object. Uh, Neowise is on the sky for quite some time now uh, from the last week onwards and I've been looking out uh, after the down you know uh, in the northwest direction but somehow I couldn't spot it. Uh, probably I can spot in 22-23 if the you know the sky is cloud free you know if it's clear. Uh, let us hope for the best and I suggest you also please try it out but make sure that you carry a binocular with you because it's a binocular object. So coming to opportunities of the next week, Newton Baba Fund for the PhD placement is 16th August and uh, Newton Postdoc is 3rd September, DPT Welcome Trust India Alliance early career is 11th August and senior and intermediate of the same thing is 30th July. Uh, Max Japanese government undergraduate is still open 17th August. S. Ramachandran National Bioscience Award by DBT is 15th August. And also Marie Curie Actions that is MSCA is 9th September is the deadline. So that's it for this week. Uh, I'll see you again next week. And if you like this video, please click thumbs up and share it in your groups and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you again next week. Goodbye.